Hi, and welcome to Trash Arts Tick, also known as TAT. For those of you who don't know, Trash Arts, we're basically a film production company who make independent films in Portsmouth, the UK. Um, and we've been around for about 12 years. We also run events such as gigs, film festivals, and our very own open mic night called Open Your Mouth which has actually been highly successful and um, we're actually back on the 10th of February at The Loft, which is above the King's Pub on Albert Road in Portsmouth. So if you're free, please come along, bring your friends and support the local scene full of talented singers, musicians, poets, comedians and much, much more. Um, it's a really good evening, so yeah, if you're about, please do come along. Um, <clears throat> whether you're already a fan or not, give us a like and hit the subscribe button for more content and you can check out two of our trailers for films that we'll be mentioning later on today um, which is actually The Truth Will Out and Millennial Killer. So basically just to give you guys an overview if uh, you're not aware of Trash Arts uh, we're basically made up of a load of different people however the main bulk of Trash Arts contains myself Ryan uh, me Sam and uh, yeah, me, Jackson, I didn't realise we were doing the me thing. <laughs> keep, keep going, sorry. So we decided to come up with Trash Arts Tick to basically give our opinions on certain things going on within the film industry. So that could be the actual main bulk of uh, Hollywood, let's say, and uh, also the independent scene. Um, so we're going to try and keep doing this weekly. So if you guys like what we're doing and you want to see more, um, please comment. And if there's a film you want us to review, let us know and we'll see if we can do it and definitely try and get it out there. Um, but moving forward, we'll be doing a load of different um, takes on in well films, independent films. And um, today... What we're going to try and do is uh, talk about the Oscars initially um, and we've got three categories in particular that we want to really dissect and get into the crux of. So they contain the best film, the best actor and the best actress. Once discussed, um, we'll be talking about a recent film festival that we actually uh, all attended, um, which is uh, an independent film festival called Horror on Sea. For those of you that aren't familiar, basically Horror on Sea is um, a place where local talent, independent talent, can actually go and showcase their films and, uh, yeah, basically network and get to know a load of other different um, filmmakers within the independent scene. Um, and when we're discussing that, we'll also be joined by Jessica Hunt, who actually co-directed The Truth Will Out with Sam, which actually got on to Horror on Sea and screened um, and was actually pleasantly um, well received, which is good. So, without further ado, let's get stuck into it. Hello. Right, so as you know, like uh, Disney are buying up everything possible and they recently <laughs> bought up 20th Century Fox. Although um, there's been a lot of accusations that they're kind of like, with their VOD site and stuff, they have a frozen access to them. They're limiting other theatrical experiences of those 20th Century Fox films. They've gone one step further, and just to make clear, we, I do not like Fox, but I respect 20th Century Fox as a film studio. Um, they have decided to take away the Fox element. The mouse is eating the Fox. It's now 20th Century Pictures and Searchlight Pictures, which is kind of like an end of an era. <laughs> they just went, you know what, let's get rid of that. That's no longer there. Let the mouse reign supreme. What, what happened to FX? Is that still part of... FX is still part of it. What actually has happened with FX is that um, Hulu, which uh, Disney have like a, had a small portion and now like a mass port, well, 20th Century Fox. It's like the indie VOD site, basically. Hmm. Um, they actually now run most of FX shows. So they're kind of still Disney, but they've put them more to their India side of things. Let's see how that works out. Kind of reminds me of the 90s when um, Disney tried to buy, well, they did buy Miramax films. And uh, yeah, there were a few problems there. So looking at other stuff happening, um, Netflix are currently trying to own everything and good on them. They've, uh, they're looking to do a commitment of 17 billion so Netflix have decided they're going to produce um, Bradley Cooper's next directing film that he'll obviously star in. Uh, and it's about Leonard Bernstein, the composer. 
and about more to do with like fractions of different points in his life and the relationship with his partner. Now Netflix obviously doing that big old money commitment, they've also got the interests of producers Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg and happy to be there and really shouldn't be as successful as he is, Todd Phillips. Um, <clears throat> with Spielberg it's interesting because Spielberg has been very vocal that he thinks that streaming films cannot win Oscars. Now obviously this sounds like Oscar bait for the future so it'd be interesting to see how that works out. Mm. On the, and also there was the PGA, which is the Producers Guild Awards, and 1917 won that film. Now statistically that usually means it's on its way to the Oscars, but then something crazy happened at the Screen Actors Guild and they gave it to Parasite, which is the first film that's ever happened to a film of an, of an international background. Which is kind of crazy and um, yeah, it makes it a bit more exciting. Yeah, I think that leads quite nicely into our first topic, which is, of course, best film. And um, for this section, I think <clears throat> what we're going to do is just focus on the, the major front runners here. So obviously, Once Upon a Time, which came out, I think, summer last year. And um, personally, I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Really enjoyed it. And um, we got 18, seven, or sorry, 1917. Make sure I get that right. There's Parasite. And um, yeah, which again, like I said, just won the SAG Awards. And then like, I think it's because it's that, because the way they do the ballot system, I would also include Jojo Rabbit in that collection. So guys, open forum. Who do you think is going to win it? Um, it's a tricky one. Like we, we've all had the opportunity to see the films. And like as the front runner on the technical level and the more safer bet is 1917. I, you see, I, I, I went to see 1917 uh, in the cinema, and it was, uh, it was really good. It was like the, the technicality, technically it was stunning, the composition of the shots was incredible, the special effects were uh, amazing, um, the, the, just the detail that went into the set design and, and everything like that, it was just uh, absolutely stunning. You really believed that you were there, and obviously with the one-shot feel to it, it really... It really sort of made you made you experience uh, what it was like home. to be on that yeah to be in, in in the no man's land during the First World War. Um, but like I, I find it a bit like I don't know uncomfortable because like the First World War was obviously everyone knows now that it was sort of a pointless war that no one really that wasn't really a good guy that wasn't a bad guy it was just sort of nation states going to war for no real reason because a because a treaty broke down um and despite that it seemed like the germans within it were sort of like they were quite demonized like the the only real sort of interaction that they had with a german soldier you, you know they who was saved from out of a, a Spoiler alert, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we should have probably the, said that at the, the start. <laughs> the English, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're listening, you're listening. You know, it's tough. Um, <laughs> but the, the, you know, they pulled the so the German soldier out of the out of the cockpit, and and you know, they're trying to rescue him, and suddenly he's stabbing one of them, and the other one has to shoot him, and like, and it just felt really like. I don't know, like every opportunity that they had, they made the British soldiers look like they were, you know, fighting the good fight and uh, the German soldiers are fighting a dirty, nasty, vicious war where they were, you know, an invading force, which wasn't, it was much more complicated than that. It was kind of almost like um, <clears throat> the Germans wanted to be there, whereas they were probably still going through the same emotions as the British, but the British were then depicted as being well, like, oh, they had to be there, so... Yeah, sort of, but I mean, I, you barely see any Germans in the film. They're much more like, like sort of shadowy figures in the background suddenly taking shots and stuff like that, which I suppose is quite real to the experience of the First World War, but at the same time, like, I think that we're, you know, we're... I always want to see war to be regarded in a more like intelligent way rather than this sort of like good guy bad guy d dynamic. Um, unless the bad guys happen to be Nazis, then you know it's fine. <laughs> by me. <laughs> Speaking of Nazis, yeah, yeah, back on Jojo to. Rabbit. <laughs> see, I, I know there's like because um, there's a controversial opinion with Jojo Rabbit that because it has such a light take on it and that it's a comedy that people are like, oh, you can't do that because there's Nazis in real life. And there is Nazis in real life, and that's bad. But 
the way it does it, it kind of, it, in some ways, it reminds me of how Life is Beautiful looks at, looks at it from a different kind of lens. And it, I personally absolutely love the film. And it's full of great performances, and it's just... And it, may, it makes you feel a lot of emotion towards it, great because director. it's an anti-hate film, yeah. Which I will not attempt to pronounce his <laughs> name. <laughs> but honestly, yeah, like... It, Although it won the um, Toronto Film Festival Award, the Audience Awards. Now, it's, again, a lot of the Oscars comes down to statistics. In previous years, even last year, Green Book won uh, the Toronto Film Award and it won Best Film. Now, tr traditionally, in the last 10 years, the majority have won either Toronto or screened at Telluride. And when it comes down to a lot of this, is just about what festivals you play for beforehand. So with Jojo Rabbit, you'd think, oh, that means it's the front runner. But it wasn't critically acclaimed. It didn't. It hasn't made as much money as 1917, and sometimes it's still a money game. Yeah. It's not even as made as much money as Parasite, which is kind of crazy because Parasite has made like a couple of, I think it's about just over 200 million, and for a Korean film, that's unheard of as a southern yeah, Korean how, film. How, how well did 1917 do at the box office? I mean, it opened pretty well. I think it opened to about 39 million its opening weekend and kept stable because it won the Golden Globe after that. So then the interest was there. Yeah. Yeah. But it's only just started rolling out. The thing with 1917, which is kind of like annoying, is that it's a late bloomer. It mm. didn't play any of the festivals, but the prestige was already there because they knew about technique and obviously Sam Mendes being an acclaimed director. Who... I think it was the hype building up to it, the fact that you know, you've got a film that is one shot. Yeah, mm. by one, one of the shot. greatest cinematographers, yeah. Roger Deakins, yeah. absolutely brilliant cinematographer. But it's still, it's always like, is it more than the gimmick? You know, like we, we discussed before, like previous Oscar winner, Birdman. Birdman is, to, to us, it goes beyond the gimmick. It works as one continuous shot. And you know it's not one continuous shot. It just works with the kind of nature of the rat tat tat like yeah, the theatre like, and the jazz vibe to it. They, 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 they did that in a sort of non-linear... We're going off subject, sorry. <laughs> Carry on, no. <laughs> still Oscars? Well, yeah, yeah, but like years ago. <laughs> so, um, yeah, returns with... with um, the film that we started talking about, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I'm with you. I absolutely loved it. It was my favorite film of last yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. I, it, it was like a breeze. And We're it, definitely on the same page yeah. when it comes to that. There's yeah, not. I, I didn't watch it. I, I'm not a big Tarantino fan. I'm just. Like, we're not going to get into it. <laughs> That's now. a whole discussion maybe a, for another time. On another yeah, podcast, we can <laughs> shout at each other about that. But like, not. not if now. you want that, hit like. <laughs> <laughs> or no. comment below. Just yeah, like. yeah, definitely comment. <laughs> See, like personally, if we were to go for a personal choice of who I thought could win, um, for a long time I was kind of like. Yeah, it's going to be Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's a very good chance. It's one of Tarantino's last films. It makes sense. But then I, I'm kind of like wanting Parasite to win because it would be the first time... Trendsetter. Yeah, and also I, I love the director. I loved Snowpiercer. I loved Okja. Yeah. And I just... It, the film's about class and it won the Palma d'Or. And I remember what he said beforehand where he was like, I don't think this film's going to translate to other people. I think this is a Korean problem. But there is a massive class problem across the world, and mm. you feel it in the film. <clears throat> You're with the people, you know. <laughs> you got, just got felt it. <laughs> yeah. <Teared up> <laughs> Don't worry, we haven't lost Sam to tears yet. <laughs> what? What would be your one to win? What me? Yeah. Uh, honestly, I'm gonna stick with Once Upon a Time. We've all kind of said three different ones. Well, we didn't actually get Jacks, but no, I don't. I don't really have one. I don't think. <laughs> I think like. Um, Parasite for the same reason that Sam said basically I love that director I loved Snowpiercer if it's about class it's probably up my street um, <laughs> like I probably don't need to see that film to make that call cool, really like I will see it though because I'm excited to see it but I think for me personally like yeah I completely get what you guys are saying but Once Upon a Time and Sam touched on it briefly there is it's the second to last Tarantino film and um, that we know of and um, well he's confirmed that he's not going to be doing film i think tv was talked about for a while um, well, he's going to do from, yeah he's got a bunch of stuff um but for me i just love the the cinematography i love the way that tarantino can take a period piece in time or like a, a a piece of history and flip it on its head and completely change the subject subjective view of um that kind of whole process that 
people went through at that time. It's surprisingly as well, because the fact of what Manson did is he changed how Hollywood felt. It yeah. did not feel free, it did not feel liberated. They stopped, as they always said, they stopped. Uh, they used to always keep the door unlocked. All of a sudden, they had to lock the door. Yeah, but they always say that. That's they, they, no, but it's that, it's that know, idea. They say it's when Hollywood's innocent died. And the fact that Tarantino gives it a very positive vibe at the end by twisting the whole entire notion of it is actually like most of Tarantino's films are very nihilistically driven at mm. the end. They usually end in a, in a, like a positive kind of dreamlike place, even though it's not real. It's just it's nice to see him ending in a more positive place. Yeah. With a lot of violence leading up to that. Positive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Tarantino. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, definitely. And I love, for me personally, like the fact that it was so colourful and the colour reflected the time period as well. And um, during Hollywood in the mm. 60s, it was just, yeah, it was absolutely gorgeous. All right, should we uh, move on to Best Actor then? Yours. So, like, with Best Actor, obviously there are five nominations, but there's no point talking about all of them because it's really between two people. And it's the, the Billion Dollar Club Whacking Phoenix for Joker, or it's Adam Driver for <clears throat> Marriage Story. Which, um, you and I have seen both those films. Mm -hmm. um, with, uh, yeah, like, it's a difficult one because... I'm on the fence on this one, really. I, I personally feel performance-wise, Adam Driver. It's a much better performance, it's a, it's a better character, and it's, you know, it's like, he's going to probably get more nominations in the future, and it feels like with Joaquin Phoenix, they missed out on the fact that he was obviously nominated for The Master, mm. and he was nominated for Walk the Line, and I can never remember the third nomination, I think it's Gladiator, but I'm not sure. But those films are far better, and The Joker is more like a a film where an actor got to do whatever the hell they wanted with a director who didn't know what to do with the actor and that thus got something out of it. Uh, and it is a brilliant performance, can't deny it. But he's done better. Like, it's, it, yeah. The one thing with The Joker is that, like, it, it's, it's a very sensitive subject, isn't it? And if you think about it, I'll probably go slightly off topic here, but if you think about it in the last number of years how um, mental health has become a lot more aware, so to showcase a film in that sort of way um, was cool but at the same time what it ended up doing was losing a little bit of context in terms of the actual story. It was still and a Batman film. They yeah, still but, had to keep bloody mentioning Batman. But what I meant, yeah I know you didn't like that, but what I mean is um, <laughs> you know the city's on breaking point but you never really see the city going. It's like an Instagram filter by fucking Scorsese that a taxi driver kind of look you know it doesn't feel authentic one bit and that's my biggest problem with that film and it makes sense his performance is so over the top that the world's never going to feel authentic. See I, I think he does a brilliant performance Yeah. And but, like, but it is very whacking Phoenix and you know I think if you probably put another well, I don't know, actor in that role, would they have done as well? I don't know. Would it have? <laughs> would the Joker have gone to the same heights as what it has because of Joaquin uh, Phoenix's performance with a different actor? I don't think so, personally. But that that's my opinion. No, I agree with you. I like Joker. I think it tackles a lot of fundamental things that are going on in our current state and um, well, humanity. Well, the thing is, as you know, I watched like that film, that indie film, Cluck, beforehand. Yeah. And although it's not the greatest film in the world, it has similarities to Joker, and it felt more real. Mm. Whereas Joker felt like it had to keep the brand. It had to do this, and it had to also try and be like an Oscar bait film at the same time. And it just got like really it, messy. With Cluck, it, it, it was um, a lot more personal, wasn't it? Like, and you're yeah. following this one person um, through their own little story that is massive to them in this huge world, but actually no one else really knows or understands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, obviously, Joe Gurno, he does become this clown that's running around um, within the Batman franchise and stuff. Um, <clears throat> it feels like it's just him in the world, yeah. if that makes sense. The, the other thing with Joaquin Phoenix is if you know anything about Joaquin Phoenix, he hates the Oscars. He hates all <laughs> awards. Yeah. He thinks it's pointless. So when you have like... What year was it that he was like sat there with his head down, shaking it? And like, oh, yeah, um, The Master. Went... That was like 2012. Yeah, yeah. So him now all smiley doing the rounds for the Oscars <laughs> feels kind of fake, even though he's an amazing actor and he's using it to advocate 
well, not advocate, but you know, like helping towards the environment. He's always bringing that, like in the Golden Globes and stuff like that. Like that's good, but it's just like it's with, for the Joker. It's not a piece of art. It's not like I would have preferred if he won for the Master. You know, that was an insane performance. Yeah, but you know, as you like. As you get older, you get less radical, don't you? So, like, that's, that's probably partly to do with it. Potentially, I mean, like, like I said, he base what he does with the performance. You could say is radical because it's it's you know it goes beyond a lot of performances. But then it is with the Joker character, which a lot of actors can go crazily brilliant, like Heath Ledger or Jared Leto. You know, <laughs> which but is they're just, two completely yeah, polar opposites. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> See, with Adam Driver, like, it's a more human performance. Yeah. And there's, like, one little bit where it's, like, I don't know, it's... it's... I still want to know why he wasn't nominated for Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It would be weird if he was nominated for two films. Yeah, I know, I know. In the Best Actor category. <laughs> and other reasons. But... Um... <laughs> We'll not get into that. That's for another yeah, podcast. Too so many other podcasts already. <laughs> I agree. I, I love Adam Driver and Marriage Story, and I think Marriage Story as a whole is a really, really humbling um, film. And just to see these two people that like still have an emotional connection with each other through their son, and um, yeah, and go through this like really traumatic experience. Adam Driver's performance in it, like there's just that whole one scene. And um, with him, Scarlett Johansson, was just absolutely took my yeah. breath away. I, I, I cried my eyes out. And, I, and the thing is, it's one of those films where people have going, well, if you, you know, if emotionally, you, you're, you're probably connected to it. And you're watching, you're like, well, how this feels like it's their life. And then you see this really human moment that happens, and you're just like, oh, that's, you know. It's... It really grinds you. Yeah. Out of them two that we think are the, the best, Sam, who do you think is going to get it? Joaquin Phoenix. Unfortunately. You think he's going to get it? Yeah. So you hope Adam Driver, though? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So... Eddie Murphy should have been nominated. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, so well, I... For Dolomite. Yeah, for Dolomite. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Jack, definitely should have been. Sorry. Who do you think would... Or is going to get I, it? I, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen either of the films. I imagine that Joaquin Phoenix is going to get it. Um... But like, and I don't really. I've not seen um, the Marriage Story, so I can't really sort of. I have not got that love for um, what is it, Matt Matt Drive? Adam Driver. Adam Driver. That's it. Adam Driver. I don't remembering names. What? Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'd love it to be Adam Driver, but I do think it'll be Whacking Phoenix. Yeah. Thing with Best Actress, like. It's, it's an awkward one because there's no point talking about like all the nominations because it's going to be Renny Zellweger for Judy. She's won every single award. It's the comeback. It's a film about the industry. There's one performance that should be in this list. Lupita Nyong'o. She should have been nominated for us. Obviously, she won the Oscar for 12 Years Slavery. Absolutely fantastic actress. And like in all honesty, like I don't know. It's just it's crazy that she wasn't nominated. She was nominated for other awards, but for some reason... And again, it comes down to what we see over and over again, horror being ignored at the Oscars. It was the same last year with Hereditary with Tony Collette. It's well, a, horror and black people being ignored at the Oscars as well. Yeah, Let's yeah, not yeah, forget yeah. that there's this quite is, a glaring, obviously, like, there's, obvious yeah. problem here. Yeah, and it's <laughs> really weird this year because, like, you just look and you're like, I mean, sure, Scarlett Johansson was good in both films, but two nominations? They couldn't have given it to someone else? There are a lot, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about what we think of the nominations after the Oscars. <laughs> uh, we've both seen um, Bombshell. Yeah. Really like Bombshell. I thought it really threw me initially when we started watching it. Because um, I, I didn't, I knew Charlize Theron was in it, but um, she obviously plays the reporter, Megan Kelly. Kelly. And um, yeah, <clears throat> I did not recognize her for the first sort of 10 minutes. And then eventually I kind of cottoned on and I kept saying to Sam, but it, like Charlie Theron's performance within that I thought was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, she was great. And she was um, very good. Yeah, she was like knowing Megan Kelly, like seeing, seeing her over years of different kind of thing and knowing a bit about the story with Roger Ailes. It's so close to it that it is strange. Mm. It's just like, how did they make her look like that? How did she get all those like little ticks and little movements so perfect? 
And that's why she deserves a nomination for that. I've always read Charlie Theron. Yeah, yeah, another film She's last quite... year. What was it? Long Shot. Another political film she did, which I actually thought she was better in Long Shot because of a different kind of film, but it's good. Oh, that was the Seth Rogen one, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that. Oh, that was cool. I mean, soppy, but, but it was Yeah, cool. it was a rom-com, it was, but it was, it was generally like, yeah. a different way. It was interesting. I, well, I personally think that it will go to Scarlett Johansson. For Best Actress? Yeah. I think the fact that Rani Zellweger has won everything, she's winning. Good point. <laughs> it's a statistics game. Judy Garland. Cool. So what we want to talk about now is just uh, a little bit more about the independent scene. Um, we were obviously massively involved in this and one of the things that we actually did recently was we went up to a festival um, in Southend-on-Sea called Horror on Sea. Um, for this bit, what I want to do is introduce uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Jessica Hunt. Hello. Come over, colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Jess has worked with us sense. on a collaboration for a number of different films and mm. uh, act, well, acted for us as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we wanted, we wanted to take this time to just basically talk about our experiences of Horror on Sea. You guys take it away. Well, um... But for you guys, it was the first time you went to Horror and Sea. Yep. Me and Jess yeah. were lucky that we got to go last year yeah. when we took up yeah. um, Lonely Hearts. So really, they should be asking us that question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how did you guys find it? <laughs> <laughs> was it good Wait. for you? Yeah, tell us about your experience. It was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, I, it, was, it, it was good to just meet some other people doing similar things to us and like, or, or you know, things other like weirdos. totally as well. Yeah, <laughs> other exactly. Groups. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you know it was inspiring to sort of see other people like you know other people doing mm -hmm. the same thing but working hard and, and making things sort of uh, unique and, and creative and, and I think one of the things that stands out for me is that whenever you're a filmmaker within the indie scene is sometimes you can get so caught up in the thought that oh you're the only one doing it and oh, sure yeah and like you guys have obviously just no, and Sam have worked together. You've just taken oh. what I was going to say pretty oh, much. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's why I'm like, yeah, absolutely, take it away. You're so just to, saying it better than I. To was. go on, <laughs> to, well, to go to that event and to see so many different filmmakers who um, basically have kind of came up with their own concepts and gone out there, done it on low budget, and then they've managed to be accepted to the, this sort of event. And uh, yeah, it was just fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Mm. I think it's great as well, like because you see them doing like other filmmakers and uh, from other films doing their their own merchandising, their own yeah. sort of posters, their own, and it makes you realise like you can be bold with these things. You can sort of go there with like you know all these posters, and people will take them, and you'll end mm. up signing them. And it's really really odd to you know. Like, go back to your job at, like, I won't say where, but, like... <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> to be fair, like, that's one of the main takeaways. Because like, there was such a transition from our experience from the first year to this year, where, obviously, where we were, like you said, took mm. posters. And, and I think, because last year when we went, it was the first time I, I knew of, like, Myco, for example. Yeah. And they've, they merged themselves, like, so well and, like, market themselves in general really well. And it, it was the first time I kind of figured, I was like, oh yeah, I forget you can kind of go there with this stuff. You kind yeah. of forget, you know? The thing is as well, because it's like, it's not competitive. It's not in a competitive nature. It's about just screening the work and just, and it does just give people a little bit of a showcase in that regards. Yeah. So when Mike would bring along, like, I remember last year they had the cardboard cutouts. I remember their, that. Their killers and stuff. Inspires you, it makes really you think cool. of, like you said, it makes me a little bit bigger. What, what can we do to push our films in that regards? Because it's horror fans. Horror fans just love to be immersed within mm. it. That's why they go there, so they can see the filmmakers and speak to them. And and even if you are, um, you know, somebody who just goes to these events and just are there for the films, you know, because there's plenty of people that go to these things just for that, and they're not necessarily either in the film or or even making the films themselves. They just love it, and there's the, like there's stalls there that you can purchase, like even sort of more well known sort of general sort of horror toys, you know, things like that. Yeah. So it's like it's a really good event just for people who, like Sam said, want to be immersed into that more. The, the, the other thing that like I really loved seeing was um, when you saw the response to people for others' films. So we we were like in the lobby 
thinking about going in to see uh, ice cream at the beach, but there was 200 people in the room. Mm. Mm. That's an insane amount. That's like nearly beyond, well, it's pretty much beyond sold out. Yeah, and it was standing room only, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure someone had to, some people had to leave. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, and, and like that was their debut film. Yeah. And, yeah. and they'd, really all, they'd well. had so much, you know, they'd yeah. been connected with that festival for years. But to have that response, that's beautiful to see. It's similar like with um, Tom Lee Rutter and just the, 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 the love that people have for the films. It's just nice, you know, it's really mm. nice. It's interesting, just to touch on the point of networking. Um, like off the back of this we've been in contact with so many different people that we met at that event yeah. Um yeah and like we've already begun sort of pre-production of some of our next feature films that we'll be filming this year and we've cast a few of the people that we met um yeah at this event which is absolutely amazing because beforehand you know we might have been sitting there scratching our heads for who could fill that role and um, we'll fill these roles and then just by going out, speaking to a few people at this awesome event, you just get introduced, and it's it's just brilliant. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you for the guys who obviously run it. Um, you do a fantastic job. Very nice hotel as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah really nice hotel. Nice hotel. Uh, <laughs> nice yeah, yeah. view over the, the yeah, sea yeah. and just here and stuff. Yeah. Like, you haven't been that was a to... cool place to drink in, yeah. I, 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 to be honest with you. I want to say... Um, to the thank you to Martin Payne as well, because he was like, even though the, the weekend that we went for Truthful Out, we didn't have, um, he wasn't involved with the Truthful Out, he was involved in Daniel Killer. But he still pushed it to everyone, because he understands yeah. that it, people want to see the films. And he really like gets himself out there and just connects with everyone. Yeah, he's good at that stuff. Yeah, and like, very good. I mean, again, the, the previous year we went there with Lonely Hearts mm. with him. We wouldn't know about Horror and Sue without Martin. So yeah, no, it's just, it's, you just meet those sort of people who are that enthusiastic and just want to work with others, it's brilliant. I might handcuff myself to him for the next one, just so I like, <laughs> just go around networking You with have him. to meet people. Like, yeah, exactly, it would make it easier, wouldn't it? Like, <laughs> you can just be like, hi, I'm Jackson, I'm handcuffed to this guy. <laughs> yeah. And there's your introduction, Default icebreaker, association. done. <laughs> we'll definitely be up there supporting again, obviously supporting everyone else's um, stuff, and also, hopefully, re-entering or entering some of our newer Most films definitely yeah yeah i can't i can't wait to get back up there and like because the thing is is you you know you, the people that you meet the first time is it's great and everything but like once you've sort of met those people like going back to that group is going to be a lot easier and then you're mm. probably yeah. going to meet more yeah. people because you, you sort of feel more comfortable and, and more like definitely. yeah yeah it's 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 good to know that you've you know met met a group of people that are going to be there but i think it's definitely given us the <clears throat> the imagination to want to go into a load more festivals around the country yeah. and even yeah, yeah. if we can given time you know um internationally or in europe and just go and explore the well, the scene a bit more and network yeah yeah mm -hmm. so on that note guys um if you've liked our first trash arts tick uh please give us a like and uh please give us a subscribe uh if you do subscribe, we've got loads of other content, loads of other um, films, trailers, etc., web series within our Trash Arts Portsmouth page. Just to let you guys know as well, you can check out the trailers for the two, well, two of our films that were actually on at Horror on Sea. That's The Truth Will Out and Millennial Killer. So please go check them out, give them a like. We're going to try and keep doing this every week. Um, so the more likes, obviously, the more we know that you guys are up for it. And uh, other than that, T-A-T out. Bye. Bye. Is that your sign out? <laughs> I don't know. I, don't I know. just love there's a peace sign. I'm like, it's an audio recording. <laughs>